Moving on to virtue, vice, mean, and excess. Um, so virtue is, well, we've already talked a little bit about it. It's the ability to reason well, to make correct judgments, to take into considerations and weigh them. Um, virtues are always going to be flanked on two sides by two vices, a vice of excess and a vice of deficiency. So I encourage, I could be, I could, um, I could overvalue danger, or I could and um, be a coward, right? If there's danger or risk, I could run away because I think that the fact that it's a dangerous situation is a strong reason not to get involved. Or I could undervalue danger. So I just run in stupidly to any sort of situation involving danger, and I don't take, an account, take it into account at all. So the virtue of courage lies between these two, um, these two vices. I didn't mean to write excess. It should say extreme, right? So the vices are the extremes, and the virtue is the mean, right? The middle between, not the exact middle, right? But it falls somewhere between two extremes. And we have to use our rational judgment, our reason, to make good judgments about uh, whether to run away from danger or to run in, or um, whether to tell a lie or tell the truth, right? So clearly, there's lots of cases where I'd be a liar if I told a lie because it wasn't appropriate to tell a lie in that case. But there's lots of cases where I'd be a fool to tell a lie, not to tell a lie. So if the Nazis come knocking on my door looking for some hiding Jews, of course I should tell a lie in those sorts of cases. Um, how does Aristotle deal with desires compared to Kant? Think about the sympathetic and unsympathetic philanthropist case. Well. Aristotle thinks that desires morally matter, right? That um, this is more the, the post, the wall posting that we had, where we talked a little bit about how Aristotle thinks that it matters that you're not only doing what you ought to, but you want to do it. Whereas Kant thinks that, you know, whether you want to do it or not, that might make it easier. But morality only gives you credit, only cares is if you're doing it because you know you ought to. Right? So you might do it because you ought to and you want to. Or you might do it because you ought to and you don't want to, but Kant doesn't care about the wants, right? So the difference between them is that Kant, Aristotle is going to give you extra credit, you know, more credit if you actually want to do your duty, whereas Kant thinks that that's, that's not a requirement of morality, that's not a moral ideal, it doesn't matter, at least to morality. It, it might matter to us in that it would make my life easier if I wanted to do the moral thing. So I might try to make it such that my wants are in line with my moral obligations, but Kant thinks that yeah, I'm not a morally better person if it comes easy. Um, how does Aristotle think of reason compared to Kant? Well, Kant thinks that reason, when we read about Kant, right, he has these, these principles and he's trying to, he has these strict principles and reason is somehow acting from principle. And for Aristotle, it's just, there are no, these, there are no principles, right? The virtue ethicist says there is no such thing as these principles. It's just the ability to read, to weigh considerations and then come to the right judgment. So there's no there's no sort of rigid principles for Aristotle. Aristotle thinks that reason is, is the you know, ability to have these character traits, this, these virtues, which allow me to be able to properly weigh reasons, pros and cons, and come to the right judgment, but not through the application of any sort of rule. Whereas Kant thinks that you know, reason is just acting from principle. So for very much for Kant, you know, reason is, is principled. How does a virtue ethicist like Aristotle think about moral rules and duties compared to Kant and the utilitarian? Well, Kant and the utilitarian think that there are rules and duties, right? Kant has the formula of universal law and the formula of humanity, and the utilitarian says maximize happiness, minimize suffering, and the utilitarian and the virtue ethicist says there are no rules, right? So we can get these virtues, and if I have these virtues, these character traits, I'll be able to make the correct judgments. Uh, you know, rules might help when I'm immature and trying to learn through my experiences and get these vir these virtues, but in general, the rules are not you know not a good basis for making these moral de moral decisions, right? Because um, there are always going to be exceptions or something along those lines. What is the justification that utilitarian always comes back to? Well, this is easy: you know, pleasure, maximizing pleasure. So a utilitarian can make any sort of adjustment to his theory as long as he can. So why might a utilitarian let someone um, say something that's going to make a lot of people uncomfortable? Well, because maybe in the long term it's going to maximize pleasure. Or maybe because letting people say what they want maximizes pleasure because maybe the sense that you're allowed to speak whatever your mind, whenever you want, even if occasionally it makes people uncomfortable and lowers pleasure, 
that sense that we all have that we're allowed to speak freely, that maximizes pleasure, which is why I have to let this one person talk. So just remember, anytime I ask you a question, I say, could a util what sort of reason would a utilitarian give for doing X? Or what sort of reason could a utilitarian do give me for saying Y? It's always going to be some way traceable back to the fact that it maximizes pleasure. Right? That's, the, that's the one value which everything else in the utilitarian system derives from. Um, act utilitarianism, rule utilitarianism. So the act utilitarian is going to be the one who says, um, I'm going to perform this action. I, you should perform this action because it maximizes pleasure. Uh, the rule utilitarian is going to say, I'm not going to judge actions by if they maximize pleasure. I'm going to judge rules by if they maximize pleasure. So, you know, don't kill innocent people ex or don't kill people except in self-defense. Well, that sort of rule would maximize pleasure. So in particular cases, when I'm trying to decide what actions to perform, I'm going to consult that rule, don't kill people except in self-defense. So I'm not going to check to make sure my actions, my each of my actions maximizes pleasure. I'm just going to check them against a set of secondary rules, which I've checked whether those will maximize pleasure. So act utilitarianism is direct, right? I check my actions directly on if they're going to maximize pleasure. Rule utilitarianism has this sort of intermediate secondary set of rules, which um, mediate my actions to whether they're going to maximize pleasure. Right? Formula of universal law, formula of humanity. So Kant says the formula of universal law is something like uh, only perform an action for a goal if your action could be the universal way of accomplishing that goal. So I, um, if I'm going to cut in line to get in front in the front of the line quicker, Kant's going to say I, the formula of universal law is going to say I should only perform that action for that goal if Cutting in line could be the universal way of getting something I want quicker. And of course it couldn't be because lines wouldn't exist anymore. Uh, the formula of humanity, don't use people, right? D treat others only as ends in themselves, not merely as means. And we've talked about that. If you look at the, the discussion board, there's a lot of good discussion about what that formula consists in. Two parts of an argument, premises and a conclusion, right? This all comes back from the Feldman readings. This is a, lot, is a, while, a while ago. Rational strength. Uh, an argument has rational strength if the conclusions are more likely to be true given the premises, right? If does is there evidence strong sh in showing that we should accept the conclusion? Rhetorical strength is their arguments persuasive, right? I might have a really weak argument that has no rational strength, right? I have horrible evidence, but it's very very persuasive because it has lots of vivid examples. Um, I'm a very convincing speaker, right? So that's going to be rhetorical strength, persuasiveness, literary merit. Something to do with grammar and spelling and uh, how interesting and exciting the argument is. Um, and we can imagine that um, an argument like that might not be rationally strong and might not be rhetorically, not, might not be persuasive, right? Um, I can imagine some people who are anti-intellectuals reading some sort of really beautifully written argument, something that's really well thought out using lots of... Um, Know, very flowery language, and someone reacts negatively to the literary merit to, of it and wanting to and rejects it, right? So that argument would be less rhetorically strong, less persuasive because it had literary merit. So all of these sorts of different strengths are independent of one another. They can an argument could have all three, but an argument could also have one of them and lack both of the other two. Um, validity, cogency, and an ill-formed argument. So an argument is well formed if the conclusion follows from the premises, right? So if I read the argument and it seems like that conclusion that conclusion would come from those premises, right? If those premises were true, then the conclusion would be true. Then it's well formed. And there's two ways of being well formed. Uh, it could be valid, which means that the conclusion is guaranteed 100% if those premises are true. So um, all senators are ambitious. John McCain is a senator. Therefore, John McCain is ambitious, right? Since I know all senators are ambitious, and I know John McCain's a senator, then I would know absolutely that John McCain was um, ambitious, and that would be a valid argument. Cogency uh, only gives me a, you know, a uh, it only increases the probability that the conclusion is true. So if I say most senators are ambitious, John McCain is a senator, Therefore, John McCain is ambitious, right? Now, now my conclusion does follow from those premises. It is sort of made more likely to be true by the premises, but now it's only more likely because I only know about most, you know, maybe John McCain's one of those senators who isn't ambitious. So cogency 
the conclusion still follows from the premises, but it only follows some sort of 51 to 99%.